Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce all of you to Mr. Rex Murphy, who's my guest today. Rex is a Canadian commentator and author who deals primarily with Canadian political and social matters. He began his lengthy career as the main interviewer and commentator for Here and Now, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's nightly TV news program in the province of Newfoundland. He was the regular host of CBC Radio 1's Cross Country Checkup, for a good while, the only nationwide call-in show in Canada, and one that was avidly listened to across the country, for 21 years before stepping down in September 2015. He has been a columnist for two of Canada's most influential newspapers. First, he wrote a weekly Saturday column in the Globe and Mail for most of the first decade of the century, and is currently writing an influential column three times weekly for the National Post. All the newspaper readers in Canada look forward to those columns. Mr. Murphy is one of Canada's most well-known figures. He writes and speaks with a witty, intense, informed, acerbic style. His capacity to lampoon, satirize, and think critically makes him the bane of unprepared politicians and other public figures across the country. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to me, Rex. Well, thank you very much for having me on. And before we get into any of the chat, let me say on Zoom what I said in private. It's very good to see you back. And I know I'm giving the giving words to about 20,000 times 20,000 other people when I say that. Well, I appreciate that very much. And it's, it is, I'm very pleased to be able to be doing this again. It's, 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 it's been, it's increasingly a treat to do. Well, I'm very pleased to hear that. I'll spoil your treat, though. You picked the wrong person for a treat. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess it depends on your taste, eh? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. So I thought we might start by walking through your professional career, your career, your life, for that matter. Uh, you you were born on the East Coast. Yeah, I was born on the East Coast in a, by the Newfoundland Center, a fairly large town. It's called Carboneer. Uh, my father worked on the American base, which was one of the five in Newfoundland that Winston Churchill kind of traded to the Americans. You remember the lease for ships? Uh, he worked there from the very beginning in 1941. We moved closer to that place. I mentioned this for a reason. Uh, when I was about 10, it, to a, a much smaller town, but because I was adjacent to the base, I had some American influence even as a kid in Newfoundland in the 50s. And that precipitated after I finally finished walking around universities. I actually taught. Uh, American students, one to 12, in the Naval Station School. And I spent a whole year there, uh, back and forth, drawing up curriculum uh, and teaching Canadian studies, believe it or not, to American kids. Uh, it's a, it was an experience that for the last 10 or 15 years, when American politics has become so dominant, that little visitation uh, to the Argentia School uh, has proved, I won't say useful, but it gives me a deeper context, I think. So where did you go to university and what did you study? I went to university two places. I went to Memorial University. I stayed there for five years. I studied English literature and I was blessed. If you want to talk to what I am pleased to call my life, uh, I think a cardinal experience, and I'm not just saying it, is that the English department at the time at Memorial University uh, the university was quite small then, 3,000 people. And by the time you got to your fourth year, if you were in an honors program, uh, you had maybe 15 or 16 students. So you, you really did get to meet and know the faculty. And three or four of them, one of them in particular, Dr. G.M. Story, who wrote over 20 years in collaboration with others, the Dictionary of Newfoundland English. And to let you know this is not some silly remark, Dr. G.M. Story was also one of the editorial advisors for the great Oxford English Dictionary, all 22 volumes of it. So here was a man of tremendous talent and, and a controlled enthusiasm, but impeccable taste and a knowledge of English literature that I haven't encountered since. I know I'm rambling on, but it's the nature of my mind. But then I went off to Oxford. I only spent a year there. I signed up for law and actually ended up going to all the English classes. Uh, Helen Gardner was the editor of Don, the friend of T.S. Eliot. 
and uh, Helen Gardner would be giving a lecture. Uh, it, it would be like if you were a rap fan or something and you, you avoided all the big names. So I, I basically read a lot for that year. Uh, second year law, came back, and I figured out then uh, I've been going to school. I went to school very young at the age of four. I've been going to one form of school or other for about 20, I'm sorry, about 17 or 18 years straight. And I decided to kind of just stop for a while. By the way, you already have noticed this. I talk too much. So stop me when I when I ramble on. Well, good. We'll have a good competition that way because one of the things that people constantly comment <laughs> You're about. You're gonna lose. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be good. It would be good for me to lose that particular battle now and then. So I, I have something to ask you about that particular comment. So I talked to Yonmi Park. Yes. Yonmi Park a, a week ago. Now you, you may know the name. She is a she escaped from North Korea. Yes. And she wrote a book called In Order to Live, which is an amazing book. And the book ends in 2015. But after 2015, she enrolled in Columbia University, which was a dream of hers and a dream of her father that she be an educated person. And she studied humanities at Columbia. And okay. I asked her what that was like. And she said that it was a complete waste of time and money. And yep. that she felt that she was completely unable to utter an opinion that was genuine the whole time she was there. And it shocked me, you know. And so I asked her very specifically. I said, come on, come on. You, you're, you're not going to tell me that the entire time you spent in Columbia, you didn't have at least one professor or two professors who stood out, who really taught you. Now, she had told me during the interview that she had encountered George Orwell's work when she was in South Korea, yep. particularly Animal Farm. And that was what um, partly what influenced her to start speaking and writing. And so mm -hmm. and, and she had read a lot when she was educating herself in South Korea prior to going to South Korean University and then to Columbia. So it's not like she was unfamiliar with the potential impact of, let's say, the classics on 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 her life, on her philosophy. Um, but when I pressed her, the best she could do was to identify a single biology class which dealt with evolution, which was a complete mm -hmm. mystery to her, given her background, because uh, history sort of started when her dynastic totalitarians were born. Um, but she said even that took a wicked turn to the politically correct direction yeah. by the time she was done. So, But your experience at university, go into that a little bit more detail. Well, I'm glad you, you elaborated that as you did. And I, I suppose, not I suppose, I know. I brought up that university experience in the hope that, and we'll do it now, down the road to this conversation. I think outside of family, uh, that is always principle and will never be superseded. Outside of family, if there's anything that, that contributed to the way that I look at things and have given me lasting benefit, okay? You may be familiar with Samuel Johnson's remark about literature. It applies to all the arts, that it exists better to help us endure life or to enjoy it. Uh, it fixes the mind. And when you have a real university, you get these things. I, my, the professor I, I, I mentioned, for example, when he found a book, it was one of Arthur Kessler's, I won't bother to name it. He actually walked to my house on a Saturday uh, after, not just a kid uh, and in awe of him, but he came to the little uh, studio, or sorry, the student house, and wanted me to have this book for a week so I could read. I mean, this kind of almost genuflection to the emergent or emerging mind of a young person is something that stays forever. So that long-winded again, the university experience is was the strongest because the universities then had values. They worshipped, and that's a good word, not to be backed off from. They worshipped the best creations, uh, the best fashions, the best styles of thought, uh, the, the best scientific uh, finesse, and they, they made you, not made you, they induced you Enticed. to be grateful, to, mm -hmm. to be grateful for what other first-rate minds have contributed to the temper of the entire human race. And now when I see, and I, I know this perhaps not quite as well as you, because you are a professor and you've gone through some of that, the grinder. Universities now, at the humanities level, from everything I read, are a disgrace. Uh, they, they, the treason of the clerks. It is. It is. They are so suffocated by these arch and empty philosophies that have no logic and are punitive. 
I would now, I, I'm a person that was so taken by the university that I almost worshipped it. And now I, I tell people that have younger people, younger children, 20, 21, 22, don't go to the damn university unless you're taking science. Go to a trades college or just go out on your own. It's the saddest thing that has happened in the Western world that we've allowed second rate minds, uh, political agents, propagandization as instruction. We have decimated the soul of the university. Uh, by the way, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you said somewhere, and I probably will not be quoting it correctly, burn them down and start it all over again. Uh, Western, one, oh, yeah, one little footnote. If the first world, as we're accustomed to calling it, wants to keep its precedence, I often think of students in Asia, in India, in China even. They are so intent on really learning something. And they'll, in an Indian school that maybe plays $100 a pupil, they're doing so much better than the school. That's the schools are in this game too, than schools getting ten and fifteen thousand dollars per student. The West is trivializing its main dynamic that has always been intellectual, and it always will be. Anyway, so sorry let's about zero that. in on that. So yesterday I talked to Paul Rossi, and Paul Rossi is the high school teacher, math teacher. Yes, who, you remember he wrote a letter week and a half ago, a column that Barry Weiss published in her Substack. I read it. Right. Okay. So we talked and he talked about his time in university studying with the post, studying postmodern philosophy. Yes. And, and he said that he was very much attracted to it at the time, but then he unpacked why. And he believed that he was resentful at that point about lacking a genuine creative voice and that the postmodern philosophy that he was taught gave him and the professors that were teaching him and his peers a weapon with which they could, yeah. a weapon yes. to undermine what it was that they were not capable of doing themselves. And so yeah. instead of the worship that you describe, which characterized your professors, and fortunately for me, my professors as well, who taught me a tremendous amount, especially in my junior college, um, they they were taught a, a method of dispensing with literature, yes. reading it as if it was something else, and I suppose morally superseding it in some sense. Oh no, absolutely! The idea that, that especially by the way, postmodernism and the deconstruction and all, all those attendant pseudo uh, philosophies. Uh, you read Milton to find out. Uh, if he mistreated his daughters, not this, this miracle that we call Paradise Lost or Samson Agonistes. You, you read Homer to find out, you know, if he's a blood worshiper. This whole, this whole game of taking the great documents of Western civilization as a hunting ground for moral uh, woke offense. Well, first of all, it's catastrophically stupid. If you have the 40th Symphony of Mozart or the Beethoven's Fifth, and the only reason you're playing it is to find out if either Mozart or Beethoven had a sexist attitude, you're out of your mind. Stop, stop this. And, and the idea that one of the great propulsions of a certain segment of Western society is simple envy and resentment of its success, even as those who are envious and resentful are basically being fed and kept by it. They go into these institutions with some sort of childish, immature and, uh, animosity towards what, you know, if you think of it, the rise of thought is, is, is the greatest thing we have. And at the, in the richest part of the world, the most prosperous, the highest institution. Have you been reading some of these whiteness things, the new rules? And this, you mean like the, the ones this, the federal government are using to train yeah. the civil servants? You mean yeah. those? Yeah, and uh, the epidemic of, of anti-racism, which is a kind of racism, diversity, which is monosyllabic. Uh, if you don't have our ideas, you don't have any, or you're a racist, or you're this, or you're that. I don't know how a free people have succumbed so easily and so lethargically to a kind of, it's, it's not physical, but it's a metaphysical restraint. And the, the cowardice about some of these, but these universities that apologize for some professor, the, 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 the New York Times guy, 49 years columnist, and, and in an explicatory conversation, using that N-word, 
The editor said, no, nothing wrong with him, but then he fired him. Uh, the universities, well, damn them, were the place that this, this other pandemic began. And while we're living through COVID, we should also understand that the intellectual pandemic, this goes to our heart and core. Uh, we are displacing ourselves by allowing charlatans to wreck the intellectual standards of the Western world. So what did your education, your education in English literature, what did that do to you and for you? So you were one person when you went in and you were a different person yes. when you came out. So what yep. has been the advantage? And I also mean, so I interviewed Jocko Willink on my podcast a while back and he talked about going to take an English literature degree after he had finished his military training. And then he explained for 20 minutes the unbelievable potency that being able to communicate gave him as a individual, and a, but also as a military leader. And so it was very striking because he made a practical yeah. case as well as a metaphysical Absolutely. and intellectual case. So personally, what did this education do for you while you were having it, and but then also afterwards in your life? Well, I actually have fairly retentive memory uh, for the entire experience, especially at Memorial University. Uh, the first thing I, I would give it the first, hey, I can give you an anecdote. I, I'm not usually biographical, by the way, but I'll do this. There was an English professor. He was from England, and he was one of those collaborators with Dr. George Story on this dictionary. He was a dialectician. Uh, his name was John Widdison. I haven't said that name in 35, 40 years. But he came into, uh, I, it, was my, it was only my first year, yeah. In the first year, we had an excerpt from Paradise Lost. It was one of the great epic similes in the very first book. He scarce had seized from the superior feet and was walking towards the shore. I could do the whole damn thing, but we won't bother you with that. But Whittison, uh, as opposed to saying, now you should read this thing, it's very complicated. It's one of those deeply ramifying similes that only Milton ever wrote. And he read it out loud. And he had a good voice. And even though Milton is a, is a very difficult poet, by the way, even though it was difficult, the sound of it, uh, Milton is the genius uh, of the auric sensations of English verse, even better than Shakespeare. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth here. I am. When he f f finished that, I hadn't heard of it. That's how bad I was. I had We had very few books in our house growing up. I went over to the library because the simile was so exciting, I had to read Paradise Lost. This wasn't prompted by anybody else. And I could repeat instances of that kind where the sharpness of what was being related, or the beauty of it, never underestimate aesthetics, the beauty of it, the precision of it, the ability to find words that have depth of meaning, that echo their own etymology, to marshal them in patterns of order. and The intellectual aura that comes out of it. And one other little tiny note I'll give you was, I, we read John Donne a lot, a lot later. And some of John Donne's love poems are extremely complex. They're so-called metaphysical, but they're intellectual in a real sense. They're hard to understand. I remember wrestling with one poem of John Donne's for about a day. I mean, only 14, 15 lines. It wasn't the sonnet, but it was in the same poem. And I finally got it. <laughs> I can still see the, the light bulb over my head in the library. In other words, I come from a, an outport background, more or less, in a cutoff culture. This is not a criticism, it's just a fact. Uh, not, as I said, a lot of material growing up in the house. And then all of a sudden, it was like a, a series of, of, of benign explosions. And the second thing that the university did, and I think properly so, by their example less than by their preaching, the professors that I met, they really did value language. They did value the, 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 the great resource of poetry that, that exists, by the way, over the centuries. And they also said, they also taught a certain courtesy of mind that you can have your disagreements, but base them on you know, the material at hand, that don't float them out of the air. If you want to talk about John Milton, uh, you talk about his poetry. You talk about, if you want, you can talk about his prose, but very few do. But you don't go into the, the poem to find something that, in some sort of deeply infantile manner, offends you now. When you write Paradise Lost, I'll listen to you criticizing it. Anyway, once again, I'm. But yeah, here's what I did. I, I memorized a lot, and that's something I would recommend to all of the people who are listening to you when they do listen to you. 
that a lot of education should be just that, should be simple retention. Put poetry and prose in your head and in your heart. The Harold Bloom used to point it out, and I agree with him, that learning by heart is more than just a trite phrase. Once you put it in there, it expands your person. And to answer your question now directly, the difference was this. Went in callow, immature, well, that's standard for the age. But I came out with something that was permanent, and that, as far as I'm concerned at least, uh, had the most enduring value outside of, as I said, domestic circumstance that I have ever had. It's still here. Okay, and so you've talked to us a fair bit specifically about poetry, and you just made a case for for memorizing it so that you can yeah. recite it. And you did recite some. And I've often found it surprising and, and remarkable to hear someone. I, I haven't memorized a lot of poetry. And I'm, I'm struck not infrequently by someone's capacity to recite. There's something unbelievably impressive about it. But you're really making a case for first poetry and epic poetry and yeah. second um, for 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 memorizing it. So first, let's go to the poetry. What's it done for you? I, you talked about aesthetic experiences first. So that was a marker, right? These series of benign explosions. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, what's it done for me? One of the great things it's done for me, um, yeah, this is, this is consistent. I, I'm being correct on this. If you read Oscar Wilde, these are the prose writers, or Walter Pater, or Samuel Johnson, or Sir Thomas Brown, uh, some of the later essays of the 20th century, by giving you Charles Lamb, you'll never write as well as they. I understand that if you're, if you're inclined to do this writing stuff. But by God, they set the standard. They set you some. You, I can't do that. Uh, Nabokov is probably my best in the modern. He's the best modern prose writer. Never be able to write a sentence like Nabokov. Never. But having read him, I'm ashamed. <laughs> I'm ashamed when I'm sloppy or lazy. And you always aim at the high ground. And what it did, it set an ideal in the mind. And words, by the way, are very precious things. I mean, you teach the Bible in many ways, and the Bible is, apart from its obvious spiritual, it is a textbook of the highest forms of language. And even Milton put it before Greece. But it sets a standard. It gives you a wrestling match. If you read a Nabokov essay, and there are some, and then you look at, in my case, some damn scribbled column. You're still trying. I, I try to find the right word because I've been prompted by all these people I've read before. And I, I, I'm glad you made the memorization. Here's what that does. You can get meaning. You can get the meaning of a line or the meaning of a verse. But there's, there's a secondary engine or energy attached to poetry and great prose. And you bring it into your mind so that you have, you know, into your living sensibility so that in some weird osmosis, it will lift your style or your attempts. And the second thing is, if, especially Sir Thomas Brown and Hydriotapia, if you have a model of, of, of high prose and it sits in your head, and you've, I do, I know several lines of it, uh, I think somehow or other it contaminates you this is a good word to use in the, in the play, but it contaminates you uh, in a rich way. You get something from it, this osmotic imitation that will only take place if you've lodged it in your, in your consciousness. And one final point, if you wish to memorize poetry and things, your best years are 15, 16 to 25, whatever you learn then and learn by heart, as I call it, I can give you reams of Hamlet, they stay. It's a lot harder to memorize at 50 or 60 or God knows 70. And I hate even to say the word. I'm rambling on again, Jordan. This is bad of me. No, it's exactly right. It's exactly right. And it's it's definitely not rambling. And maybe that's because you've been infected with the poetic spirit. I mean, I, I have to let all our reader, our listeners and watchers know that I mean, Rex's column is very, very influential in Canada, and it's not least because of the manner in which he crafts his words. And so, how much poetry do you know by heart, do you think? Uh, it, in my prime, I, I, this is it's not sound like a boast, it is a boast. I memorized all of John Donne because his poems, apart from the uh, uh, Immortality of the Soul, that those are very long, but all his songs and sonnets, the love poetry and the religious sonnet, the divine sonnets of John Donne, by the way, are marvelous things. So, so, so also is, is his sermons. 
I wish people would read them today just for the glory of, of the rhetoric. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, it is phenomenal. I read, a, a, did a lot of Milton memorizing most of the sonnets. He thought, I saw my lady spells it saint, vengeful Lord, thy, thy saints, whose bones I scattered on the Alpine. I can go on and on. I, I, me I memorized the ones that most impressed me and it had impact. And I listened to Richard Burton and John Gielgud on record. Mm. And after listening, by the way, that's the easiest way. If you listen five or six times and it lodges in your mind, it will never go out. Uh, and so the, the recordings in those days, you, you get the seven ages of, of Shakespeare with Gielgud reading it with his infinitely nuanced articulation. No one could speak a word better than Gielgud. It stays with you. Uh, the only thing the easier to remember, of course, is music. And music plays in your head. If you play the sonata or something enough on the record, uh, that, that'll be alive 25 years later. But to memorize poetry, do it when you're young, and what you memorize at that period becomes permanently installed. It so fades can you and you recite later. Some, would you recite something for us? Uh, I'll probably stumble now because you're putting me on the spot, but I just I just started with the uh, the Milton comment. I think of it, and methought I saw my latest spells at Saint brought to me like Alcestis from the grave whom Jove's great son to her glad husband gave, rescued from death, though pale and faint. And the, the thing there is, we thought I saw my latest spouse at Saint, that was Milton's second wife, brought to me like Alcestis from the grave. And there's a, there's a place to stop. We'll see we're doing this. Alcestis uh, was a, a Greek woman. I forget the, the, her husband's name, but the husband was told that he was shortly to die. And he was very, very young. Uh, they were both friends of Hercules, okay? And so Hercules came to their house after the wife had died, but he didn't know that Alcestis had died, he, and he didn't know the house was in mourning. And after nine days of feasting, as only Hercules could, uh, me thought I saw my life. The, the husband came and told him the story that he had been told by the gods that he was going to die young, and he went to his parents, and they said he said to them, uh, "You are very old, uh, so therefore, if you take my place, you will not lose many years, but." Uh, I will be saved. And his parents turned him down and his friends turned him down. And Alcestis, his wife, without even being asked, she submitted herself to immortality. She died for him. So when Hercules heard the news and that he'd been treated so well, he, he Hercules, he determined to repay the hospitality by going into the underworld. He picked Alcestis away from Dis and he brought him back. I forget the husband's name for some reason. But he would not, he wanted to make it a surprise. So he put a veil over the returned wife's face. And when he, he came to the husband, he gradually undid the veil and gave him back from the dead, his living wife. Now go back to the, the couple of sentences I gave you. He thought I saw my late espoused saint brought to me like Alcestis from the grave. There's a few lines down. Her face was veiled, yet to my fancy sight, love, sweetness, goodness, in her face shine, as in no face with more delight. So when Milton throws out Alcestis, there's only one word. There's an entire train of secondary thought and mythology just in that one little line. This is why you would study him, so that you get in tremendous range and depth all within, this, these are sonnets. Anyway, that's the me thought I saw my latest about the saint Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints whose bones I scattered on the Alpine Mountain School, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, we could do this all day, but uh, there's no need. <laughs> well, it's so interesting me, to me to see you reflect on your education and your poetic education, given the track of your career. And, yeah. and well, because it's pr it, it was also so practical. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And, and you're, you're making a, a very strong and personal case for the utility of English literature. Now, you said you grew up in a house that didn't have a lot of books. You no, know, we were not, not making any, any depression stories. We were, we never missed a meal, uh, but we didn't have books. Uh, once in a while, one of those Reader's Digest condensed books, would, my father and Harry would get them on the base or something. Uh, in the school we went to, it was a library that consisted mainly of the lives of the saints. Uh, what? No, there weren't. There was, you know, if there, if there were five or six, by the time I was 13, 14, I was buying the, the novels in the drugstore. The drugstores used to have the little book racks in those days. But it was only when I got in university and it all came on, I, I devoured, I, I did about 
14 out of 20 courses in those that 20 was a BA to 14 or 15 of them were English. I even added a couple of subjects, English studies in the fourth year. I was up to seven when you did five a year in those days. But in the university, like, like I told you about the Paradise Lost, you go over, you, you went to the library, you can pick up what you wanted. And those days you walked the stacks, so you would often be prompted merely by the title of a book and pick it up. So no, there weren't many, uh, but that's not unusual in Newfoundland. And But in other ways, a Newfoundland education would be looked upon as very back, back, you know, backward now, but we missed some things. I was Catholic. And we brought it by an, in a, a nun's school, Presentation Sisters. And one of the benefits of a Catholic education was the catechism. This is something you had to memorize. So we're back to this again. The Butler's Catechism, you had it for seven or eight years continuously. And it started off, who made you? God made you. Why did he make you to know and love him here on earth and afterwards serve with him forever in heaven? Uh, it got more complicated as it went through. Now, you were being taught religion. But when you got old enough to see it, it, it also had taught you slyly logic because it was a question and it was a catechism uh, how do you know that there's a purgatory they had a great long i can almost do that one too a great long answer to that they said if this is this and that's that then there must be this so it was inferentially teaching you logic and because it was using scholastic terms these were old books it was it was basically building your vocabulary if you paid attention to it we often get the best benefits from certain kinds of learning inadvertently and, and insidiously, benignly insidiously, they come at us. I never understood why the catechism held such power, but it was just that. It was essay writing, too. Uh, you didn't do things sloppily or loosely. So what would be looked upon, oh, they're teaching them rote, and this is terrible, or treating them like robots. Uh, you never know what's going in and the chemistry that forms. Anyway. Well, it's really interesting ahead. to me that you're that you're making a case for it as an advanced form of imitation. Yeah. You know, I mean, when children play, when they play being a dad, for example, when they're playing house, they don't mimic the father, but by which I mean they don't precisely duplicate with their body the actions they saw their father take. What they do is they view the father's actions across a broad range of situations and they extract out the gist and then yes. they embody the gist. And that, that play development's incredibly important, and it's based on a very complex mimicry. And the case you're making is that by embodying the poetry, which is to memorize it, that you're also, you're also imbibing the gist, essentially. Yes. And that, yeah. so there's a living spirit there that inhabits you as a consequence of the, of, the, of the mimicry. And I've never heard that case made before. It makes sense to me because, of course, poet, poetry, especially declaimed poetry is a dramatic art and so it is a performance it's even more than that it's it's incantatory in both senses here's another little little this is my here's a better key to it there's a line in, in again another line of milton sweet is the breath of morn her rising sweet with charm of earliest birds now you know what a charm is it's a spell it casts you over uh he uses another word another place my, my, my enchanted we, we speak of of poetry, when he says the word the charm of early, he's talking about song. But it's interesting that song and charm are actually synonyms that when we speak of charming, we're speaking of an invisible power of allure. And when we speak of a poem as incantatory or a spell, we're doing the same thing. There's an aura that you, you use in slightly different terms. If Once you absorb it, uh, there's a sheen. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, that propels some some part of the motor of your consciousness. Mm -hmm. But only if you imitate the best, because only the best contain this particular, here's an awful ugly word, battery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm going to have to think about that some more. We'll return to it. So you took an, an excess load of courses. What did your parents think about your choice of university <laughs> education? And, and how did you manage to, how did you manage to fortify yourself psychologically, let's say, to go commit yourself to an English literature degree? Well, I, I was, again, I was very young. It was the lowest mark I had in high school. <laughs> so there was, there was a little bit of a paradox, and it was only in the university. But it, it, it came on, as I, by my own metaphor, with, with very sudden, uh, powerful attraction and action. And the, the more I got into it, the better it was. But also, here was a, there was another dynamic factor because you just spoke of parents. 
and seeing that that's the territory that you often enter, I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer what I, normally I wouldn't. Uh, my father, uh, he came from very hard circumstance. Mother, not, not, not alive. Uh, I won't go into all of it. But he basically got the grade two or three in Newfoundland. Uh, he was a smart man. And he, he did all sorts of hard work when he was a teenager. Uh, and when he finally went to work on the base, it was as a you know dishwasher. But he met some people in, on the American base. He knew, and he remember he was again one of these stoics, which I much more appreciate than the gush merchants of the day and the Oprahification. The thing was, he knew, and he never made a point of it, that it, had he had school, could he have been able to attend a real one? That he had this facility. In this case, by the way, it was with language. Uh, even though he was not a reader, because of reasons I've given you, he had a taste for words and, and compressed experiences. And he met one or two very well-educated Americans. And I think just by being there with him, knowing how much, I think it must have been a great pain, actually, uh, knowing how much he knew that he had missed and how... How, hell, how amputated were his ambitions by the non-education that it seeped down to me hmm. that getting one uh, was, a, was just something formidably insistent. And I, I suppose we all, as you say, your parents, I suppose I was trying out of some sort of devotion to kind of by surrogacy pick up what he could never have gotten because of time and circumstance. Well, it would, also, uh, it would also imply, I would say, that he, at minimum, didn't interfere with the manifestation no, no. of that spirit no. in you, and I suspect would have encouraged it. Both parents had great belief in one thing. I love the old phrases, by the way. I wish we'd bring them back. Do your books. If you don't make it through the school, you'll be digging ditches. Marie, my mother, was like Harry, my father. They had a justifiably dutiful respect, even in some of the more ignorant instructors that were in those presentation schools. But they knew that there was one way up, and I, I'm not speaking commercially, I'm not speaking it was something attached to the dignity of the person and the, the amplitude of the personality only gets released by trying to imitate, listen to, Walk your mind around the minds of other people whose minds are better than your own. And that's what philosophy, literature, I would expect uh, your specialty. It is always those who have thought more deeply, more profoundly, and have a better equipment that give us things. And that's why, by the way, I'm back now to the university. That's why it's so deplorable that this, 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 this fascist, I'll use their words, this, this petty fascism of wokeness. Uh, is suffocating uh, the, the number one energy of any free society. So no, they didn't. So how do you they, think your parents? It's it's interesting. How how do you think your parents developed that respect, and why did they hold it? Well, Harry, my father, uh, because he was he was certainly bright enough to know when he heard other people. I'm speaking chiefly now of the Americans with sophisticated uh, understandings and sophisticated things. He, he saw the goal in, in, in the rift, but he, he never had a chance to reach for it. So, but, and, he, and he was willing to admire it rather than to be resentful about it. Absolutely. He would, he would listen to these people. He would remember some of their sharpest lines. He had a great sense of humor. Mm. Uh, he, was, he was himself a, a very good talker. Most new lenders are, I suppose. Mm. And they often have a very good sense of humor, which is appreciation uh, I, for words. Well, I, I think I, you know, that, that's the, the second context. Uh, I, I do remember you know, the older guys that I knew, and not just these folklore stories. Either. They could talk about going in to buy a plug of tobacco and hold you spellbound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's and, actually and something would, I've noticed about um, extremely intelligent people who aren't educated. Yeah. They have a facility to dramatize their lives that's really quite spectacular. I, where I grew up, I had friends who were really not literate, a number of them, but they weren't stupid. 
And they could spin a story, man. It was impressive. And in a way, I couldn't. In, in some sense, I think I lost the drama, dramatic yeah. sense of my own life because of the books I had been exposed to. But they were very good at that. I, 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 your point, I, I've made this myself. You might want to tell us uh, that there's a whole lot of illiterate Newfoundlanders. That may well be your choice. But do not think... Do not think that they're not some the most ver verbally intelligent. I'll, I'll tell you as a fact, I've done, I don't know, 100, 200 documentaries. And I did a documentary on the Newfoundland fishery about 25 years ago. And I met a guy up in Lansa Meadows, fisherman, hard case, heavy drinker, I would guess. I'd, I'd give him a grade two or grade three. But he walked out of his house on a cold, frigid February Saturday morning on a, with the, with the wind coming off the water and the cap, the air flaps out, and he gave an answer to one of one of my questions, a five minute aria. I you know, I can remember. You see that boat over there? It gives me a a, a, a knob in my guts and a tear in my eyes. How he began, and I tell you, uh, <laughs> outside of Shakespeare, going on, that was the most that was the most verbally charged anecdote that I ever put on film for when we brought it back to the to the national people were coming into the edit room to watch this guy and as I said he may have been illiterate but by God he knew his words and that's another one by the way I, I always admired I think the, we called them uneducated that's nonsense so the smartest people I know probably couldn't sign their name but by God, if you if you if you felt them, if you if you moved around them, I was always afraid of fishermen because they were always smarter. Not all of them, but if you do an interview with one of them, you got you better be on your toes. Anyway, I'm going on again. Hmm, hmm. Okay, Can't so you us. and you took an excess of of courses at, yep. at Memorial, so you were very highly motivated. What about your peer group at that time? Uh, no, that was they were more or less again. The, the, they had a, a bit more, uh, I think, commitment to the idea of real education, as I'm calling it, than perhaps today. I, I think there's a lot of just going for the credential. But moving on again, I'll give background to more than particular. Well, because I'm going to interrupt there. I, I would yep, say one ahead. thing about undergraduates that I've observed, that because I love teaching the undergraduates I had contact with. They would come into class with a veil of cynicism, and sometimes that was well, we're doing this for the grade or we have a practical reason yeah. in mind. But if you could get under that and communicate yeah. something to them that was genuine, genuinely philosophical and meaningful, they would drop that surface level cynicism and dive into it like people who were starving. Well, that, if you will forgive a, a, a reference back to you, uh, the explosion that you set off uh, once the, the controversy had propelled you in, into this world arena, and the number of otherwise cynical minds. I, I told you when, when you and I had a previous interview on, on that silly channel that I have, uh, I had this call. I'm not going to name him because it would be embarrassing. A 55-year-old uh, working in a really hard job, no big money. And he, he actually called me up. I hadn't met you or anything. And he called me up to say that, you know what, I've been reading Jordan Peterson. This is, if, if the teacher... If the, the guide offers something that is real, uh, depth, dignity, spirit, points towards, you know, you are better than you are, uh, speaks honestly. And there, there's another. Well, so, that's so the sweet. advantage to something of it's higher so value. It's like, of course, you're lesser in relationship to it, but it's what you could become. Yeah. And to offer people what they could become is, is yeah. the best possible thing you can do for them. Well, I, I've seen, uh, again, maybe mischaracterizing, I don't think it's deliberate, but uh, insofar as there is a, a standing champion leading something of a counter-rebellion against the degradation of analysis and thought and, and the casting aside of cultural verities, uh, you're it. Uh, and you have, by example, and also uh, true to great tribulation, uh, you've given solace to a hell of a lot of people. And I think it has a lot to do with something general in the air. That there's a lot of suffocated uh, minds because they feel the walls coming in. They, they wonder if they're alone. And then someone comes by and says some 
in some cases, not being insulting, some very obvious things, but with a lot of thought and energy and commitment behind it. And as you know, it's a, half the world's arenas are filled waiting to hear an honest voice. That's pretty good, by the way. You went from Memorial to Oxford. How did that happen? I won the Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, there was Newfoundland because it had been uh, a, you won a, a Rhodes, Sorry, you won a Rhodes Scholarship. Yeah, I won a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, 68. And uh, again, it was a bit of my father. I thought I wanted to study law for some reason. Uh, when I got over there, as, as I think I told you before we started here, uh, I, I entered into second year studies with a, uh, any break. I mean, trust land law, I mean, just terrible stuff and the weekly assignments. But you're in Oxford, you got Blackwoods, you got some of the greatest lecturers on English literature, some of the editors, some, some of the prime editors of some of the great voices. Uh, as I, you know, Helen Gardner was T.S. Eliot's friend, for God's sake. And she's giving a lecture on Dunn. She edited the Dunn songs and sonnets. So I, I became completely absorbed in, I did the law stuff, but I, I spent more time reading English. I, I never read this much in my entire life. What was it like for you to to go to Oxford? Had you traveled at all? No. Had you, no, uh, so you, this is the first time you'd been to Europe. I mean, the reason I'm asking in part is because I've met some very educated Englishmen, like Stephen Fry. And it's yeah. really something to meet an educated Englishman because they have a depth of education that's just quite stunning. Yeah. And it's so it's so impressive when you see it manifest itself. And I've been yeah. fortunate enough to talk with people at Cambridge and Ox Oxford who are scholars from the old school, let's say. And yeah. Yeah. it's so it's so impressive to watch them talk and to watch them think. And so you pulled yourself out of Newfoundland and went over to Oxford. What was how old were you and what was that like? Uh, I was 19, I think. I went to university, as I said, very early. Uh, what was it like? Um, I'd had, as, as I mentioned, uh, five years of memorial studying literature. I should have kept at it, but I should have picked up a D film, stayed away from law. I met like you did. Uh, I met some extremely keen minds. I met a guy who could play uh, the Bach Toccata on the great organs. I met them in all fields. And th th that was the only advantage of it to me. By then, maybe a, a bit young, but nonetheless, I, I'd settled in pretty well to English literature. And it was that that kept dragging me away, as I was just about to say. I don't think I've ever read more in a single year uh, than I did that year there. Well, that's the thing about university, and I suppose also about those English universities in particular, because you imagine what the university, because I've tried to think, well, what is the university? Yeah, okay. Part of it is, well, this it's this continuous conversation across centuries. Part of it is yeah. the ex exposure to the greatest thinkers and, and for, for the purpose of, of mimicry, essentially. I believe that's central to it because you can pick your peers in some sense. That's what you do when you read great books is you make these people your peers, at least insofar as you're capable of doing that. Yeah, I agree and, with you. And, and, but then there's also an identity that it provides you with is you're a student, you've got this yes. time that's cut out, and now you can go throw yourself into the study and, and society has built a wall around you that says yes. you can stay in this room and you're good. Read yeah. away. We're happy about it. Well, that, that, that's it. The one thing I will remark, and I don't care how pretentious it sounds, in, in one area, I was a little disappointed. Uh, I thought because of the reputation of the university uh, that it would have a surplus. It would have an excess of overbright people uh, who listened to the late quartets of Beethoven as they got out of bed. <laughs> I had a false notion that reality is often just day to day. And while there will be great exceptions, and there were, and ex people are so bright that they embarrassed you if you were standing in front of them. But, but a lot of it was, apart from the architecture and the grounds, which is first class, uh, it was nice to be there uh, as, a, as a kind of a visitor. Uh, but the intellectual level, as I said, I, I probably didn't get out as much as I should. But once I got near the libraries, uh, I became enthralled. And that's the same word as enchanted and charm. Uh, I keep reminding people that 
the art art has magic. Yes. Well, and I think it's really useful to point out the connection between those words because they all point to the possession, to the yeah, capacity to be possessed by this possessed. spirit, which, and it is the spirit that inhabits the university when it's properly conducted. Yes, it's the yes. spirit that, that manifests itself as the creative and communicative conversation that's gone across centuries that you can now immerse yourself in and become a part of. And there isn't yeah. anything better than that. That's, that's, that's as good as it gets. That's also why it's so wonderful often to be a university professor or a teacher is because you can play a role in transmitting that to young people who will benefit immensely from it in all possible yeah. ways. Yeah, it's very true. It's also true, again, I'm sure you have because you're in the university context. Uh, I've met two or three uh, I'd almost compare them to, you know, some of the great medieval monks. You meet one or two or three people who are so uh, completely immured in in the dignity of learning from the past and pursuing great minds. Truly learned people. Uh, they are almost always in a kind of personal cloister. But there's one or two or three in the course of a lifetime, and you say they're so we, almost priestly. Uh, about the human being that gives to inquiry, to learning, uh, to the development and, and fulfillment of mind. And you, you just know you're in a very special place. Now, again, well, when I, I went to teach at Harvard in, in the 90s, and I was privileged to have a position there for five years, six years, I guess. And Harvard pulled in senior professors from everywhere who were at the top of their profession. And so there was a handful of senior psychology professors there when I was there. And it was wonderful to talk to these people. Yeah, yeah. I, I had never been anywhere where there wasn't anything I could say that they weren't familiar with. <laughs> it was so amazing. It's, <laughs> there wasn't a topic I could possibly bring up that these, and it would, it would have been six or seven people, which is actually a lot. It was a small department. Yeah. The, the senior faculty were absolutely outstanding yeah. people, especially the older ones, because they weren't only great psychologists, they were really educated. And so, yeah, yeah. and they weren't afraid of ideas at all. And I, huh. my mind ranges across ideas. And I'd often encounter people with whom I could have a conversation about one thing, but definitely not about another. And I just never ran into that barrier among the older senior faculty members um, at Harvard. The junior faculty members were impressive in their own right. They hadn't had the whole mm -hmm. advantage of a lifetime of study yet. You know, they were headed in that direction. But the senior faculty were, were remarkable. And you couldn't help but be immensely, uh, what would you say, to... to to be possessed by immense respect in their presence. Yeah. And it was a privilege to be there. Well, there's the other thing for the people today that if the universities become proselytizers and, and semi-political agitprop, wokeness and all this garbage, they're stealing a lot of joy. I mean, a real university, as you, as you just said, dealing with people that are better than you. That's the great thing, incidentally. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure. And you don't have... Who, who has, as you said, you're given freedom to do this uh, and, and get credit for it as well, and you'll advance in society. But the simple joy of taking in, uh, and especially in the humanity, I know science has its ecstasies as well, and they're probably even more powerful. But the joy of the humanity is that, you, as you said, you, you're talking to Charles Lamb. I often, when I read his letters, because he had a very hard life, I, I take great... I almost own. I, I'm allowed, to, not allowed, I'm capable of reading what a person of in the early 19th century actually thought and how he thought. He's in the room. That's a great privilege, too. You see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, yeah, we throw away so many things that are at our, at our elbow and we, we, we search in vain for things that are 20 miles away. It's, it's so awful. So, okay, so you were at Oxford and you were there for one year? Yeah, one year. And, and then what? What happened next? Well, he, uh, he was probably very foolish. As I said, I, I started to think about it. Uh, I went to school uh, at four, and I'd been going continuously. Uh, Oxford was the sixth year of university, I think it was. And when I got home to Newfoundland during the summer break, I decided I'd take another break. And that's when I, I said, I got I to stop going to schools. And there was a job when I, I, I did some teaching. I went on the American base and taught some American kids. 
And <clears throat> then, uh, literally, and I know the meaning of literally, uh, I stumbled into a radio station in St. John's when I was doing some work on a master's thesis, just idle work. I had no money. And they gave me a job for the afternoon in the newsroom. Monday, uh, they signed me up for a month to fill in for an open line host. And a month later, I was working at CBC. So here, that's it. Uh, my so-called career uh, was as accidental as walking into that newsroom because I had a friend there. Uh, I needed a bit of money. I took on the open line show with no experience. And this is a Newfoundland open line show, by the way. And uh, started to write editorials for the radio station. And so why could you do it? Like, why? I mean, we've, we've talked about your education. Obviously, that played a role. But, and it's accidental in a sense. But, I mean, you've been preparing to use words for a long time. Yeah, and I had. So, so I, had. I mean, it was an accident waiting to happen in some sense. So you walked into the radio station. But what was it about what you were capable of that opened up the doors? Well, I tell you, Newfoundland had another advantage. Newfoundland is a large part of every Newfoundlander in a way that other provinces, and I'm not being parochial, are perhaps not, perhaps not. And Newfoundland politics, when I was growing up, was the politics of this rather, he was legendary for sure, Joey Smallwood. He brought us into Confederation. He was mercurial. Uh, he, was, he was another autodidact. He was another self-taught man. Uh, uh, in the old sense, oratorical, the Tommy Douglas kind of oratory. And Newfoundland politics was both a curse and an entertainment. And I, I often said, I often wrote this, that we put up with it because on other planes, it gives us continuous amusement. It, Newfoundland has weather and politics, and they both exist as a form of conversation and entertainment. And my father, again, was speaking the words, listening to Joey giving some great tirade. He just loved to listen when Smallwood let loose. And a lot of Newfoundlanders did as well. It, it is a verbal culture. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I never, but journalism per se, I, I never aspired to it. Uh, but once I got in there, uh, I found that, if you'll forgive this, I found it very easy and natural uh, that you should write things. Uh, I didn't think much in the writing, by the way, and not being shy, not being coy. I always, because I have examples, Flann O'Brien would be yet another one. Uh, and Malcolm Muggeridge, I met him once or twice. Uh, these were masters. So there was always a kind of, not a chill, but a holding back. But as you get older, <laughs> there's not much to hold back anymore. So no, it was accidental, uh, but it just happened. I then ended up at CBC, that Here and Now program you referenced at the very beginning. And did that for seven or eight years. Went to a few other places. But I always came back. And obviously, once I came to Toronto uh, in the middle 90s, uh, this is about 23 or 24 years. Uh, this has been the, the kind of most, most furious uh, commitment to the cause, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very lethargic in thinking of it in terms of any great seriousness. I like to think that I just assume you were amused with something I said as to think I was right. And well, I don't think often the there's not that much difference between those two things. <laughs> very true. Very true. So, okay, so you were you were working at Here and Now, and and how how often were you broadcasting a show? Every night, uh, I did usually one or two interviews a night. I also did. They were much briefer in those days. I also did. I was the only one who did actually uh, commentary. I did two, two or three a week. I wrote, uh, I, I covered, reviewed concerts for certain national radio programs and write reviews of concerts. Uh, I, on and off, I had a lot of, a lot of fires and you know, irons in a lot of fires, but it just seemed more of a hobby. There, there's, it's an easy word. I don't know why I couldn't find it. This was like, you know, something you were half pleased to be doing and was paying your rent. <clears throat> that, that's, that's been journalism to me. I, I do not have. Uh, this is high compulsive, sanctified idea of the great worth of the journalists of the earth. They're the only people that I think could be put in competition with the politicians. There are certain exceptions. I think Glenn Greenwald right now, for example, in the last seven or eight months, in covering a lot of the mistruths of journalism is doing a great job. Uh, but it was there. I, I did enjoy doing it. I like politics as a drama. Uh, and those therefore, and I like books. So you could, okay, I did book reviews as well. So it all just came together and uh, a non-planned, 
but by inertia and uh, and taste. Uh, something I stuck with uh, till this moment. I'm talking with you. And so, why do you think you had public appeal? That's a really good question. Uh, I was always chastised in the earliest part of the so-called racket. Why don't you? I remember writing one one column for the radio station. Other people read it when before I get to CBC, <clears throat> and the owner of the station. He called me in afterwards. He I, he hired me to write. He, he had his announcer read, and he, I did this column. Uh, and he calls me into his office. He said, "What was all that about?" And so, in, in informal conversation, <clears throat> uh, I gave him the gist of what I had written and structured for the announcer. And then he looked at me. And said, "Why can't you do that all the time?" <laughs> that was a problem. That was a problem with CBC as well. They kept telling me that uh, you can't write like that, and uh, that's too too. I have the totally different understanding of communication. Uh, here's another one. This, this, is, this is true. I did a particularly savage thing one night. In Newfoundland, you can be much more savage than you can in, in the delicate uh, altitudes of Toronto and CBC. Believe me, you can. You can draw blood on there if you have the skill. Do you think I that's did, a consequence of it being a fund, fundamentally a working class culture in Newfoundland? Uh, yeah, you're exposed more. You, you actually tasted more reality. Yeah, well, I know in, where I grew up was a working class culture, and it like the the, the verbal barbs and exchanges were quite brutal. Generally, well, very very funny, um, and but also quite brutal. When you when in in my case, because you got really well known in the in the island, uh, if you said something the previous night and you went out the next morning, uh, I almost got chased a couple of times. But to go back to this one point about communication, mm -hmm. I did this savage thing, attacked mercilessly, a lot of phone calls because before the internet. Registering reaction. When I came into CBC, one of the one of the cleaners was there, and he looks at me. Rex, he said, Doug, "Boy, he said that was, that was some going over there last night." And I saw it. I said, "Yeah." He said, "By the way, he said, whose side were you on?" <laughs> <laughs> Here's the point: communication, even when it's verbal, carries a lot more. Tone tells you your sensibility goes under the text. Uh, manner of delivery gives a, an index of where it's going. I've had people from Pakistan, and don't give me any old racist bullshit, but Pakistan and Africa meeting the cabs of, uh, in the cabs of Toronto, and I know they can't understand this because they haven't yet picked up the English, okay? Don't come back with any complaints. And they say, oh, that was so good. It always reminds me that even with hyperverbal, though I might be in certain ways, that is a deeper communication, especially in the mass media, that has never taken into account. So what I was, by their standards, doing a little bit of high style, you're communicating by your manners, by your eyes. Well, that's one of the things tone. that one of that's one of the things I think that that makes you somewhat singular among Canadian journalists is that not only are you very able with your words and witty with them and powerful with them, but you're also markedly a dramatic character, and, I, and I, I don't I don't know exactly how to separate the character from the person the person, and maybe there is no separation. But I watch you on, watched you on CBC and listened to you, and there's always drama in your presentation, oh. and there's 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 a performative action aspect. So it, it's it's romantic, I suppose, is the right way of thinking about it, is because that's the the effective union of emotion and and rationality and and you embody that so it's like watching someone put on a performance although it's well and then i suppose you've been doing this for yeah. so long i don't know how much of it is a performance and how much of it is you it's very effective well i know one thing that that long use has given i found the hardest and this was the only conscious part I think the hardest thing to do if you're in the television business, don't go into it now, it's on its way out. But if you're in there, is to gradually reduce to extinction. The gap between, I use this phrase in the column recently, preparing a face to meet the faces that you meet. The gap between, oh, I'm on a camera and therefore I gotta do this and I gotta say it's this way and all this stuff. When you can bring the prepared remark identically with a totally relaxed being. And if you mean it, I used to say this, I did five or six columns a year or commentaries that I really meant. 
And if you really mean it, you could go on stammering and people would listen to you. Reducing the gap between the posture or the posturing and I'm talking to a neighbor. Okay, How so, are you well, doing? so you know, one of the things I've really observed, because I've done a lot of television interviews now, and I've yes, done you a lot have. Of, <laughs> and a lot of this sort of discussion, which I radically prefer, which I think is immensely superior. But so in the typical television interview, I would walk into the studio and I would meet the interviewer and we would have yeah. a cordial and professional conversation. Yes. But I was actually talking to the person more or less. Yes. And then the cameras would go on and yeah. the person was no longer there at all. I know, and, and I know. So then I was trying to figure out, well, what's exactly there? And well, part of it was the, the, the person in some sense didn't dare to be there because the bandwidth was extremely expensive. And if you're there being spontaneous, you can make spontaneous errors yes. and, and, and that can be very costly to you and to your network. And so, so frequently I was just talking to whoever it was acting out the role of the journalist they thought their yes, station exactly. demanded. And so there was no conversation. And some of the conversations, interviews that I've had that have gone viral were exactly like that, where it wasn't a conversation. <laughs> Whatever it was, was something completely different. But th th this, there's something essential about what you said with regards to this diminishment of the gap between the persona and the, and the person. And so... The persona, this is from the psychology of Carl Jung. Jung thought about the persona as a crafted presentation yes. that you used for expedient yep. purposes. And, Absolutely. And, and so maybe you walk into a bank and you do a transaction and you're the customer and, and she's the teller or he's the teller. And there's a script there and that's fine. That's where a persona works because you don't want to get personal while you're just, you know, exchanging business information. But... In a conversation, it, it's a diff different thing because the persona is something that isn't genuine. And what yes, that means exactly. is the questions aren't genuine. And if the questions aren't genuine, then it's not interesting. You said you can stammer and stumble about as long as you mean it. And you can. Yeah. And uh, what do you, do you think about, what is it? Well, you talked also about the nonverbal component. What do you think is carrying the 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 sense that you mean it. What are people observing in the performance, let's say, or in the presentation? There's an intensity. Yes, you're, it's a, it really is. And I, I know this is straight. That's a really good question. I always knew, uh, it's intuition, that when you showed up on television, especially in, in the role of commentator and, and interview, incidentally, that if I was pretending it bled out through the screen, now, of course, there's times you're having fun and you're not being serious. You do all sorts of fun. In the ones I, I used to like to say, the ones that really count, if you put on a face, uh, the, the radar of, of human beings, the radar of every human being, especially, again, in this public thing, they know it's wrong. Uh, politicians, I, I remember I did a thing on the national. Every time the politician comes to an election, this was true of Mr. Harper, whom I like, as it was of, uh, of Mr. Trudeau in particular, that the voice that starts to come out of them in their commercials is like something that's never been heard on heaven or earth before. They actually change their vocal tone uh, when they give out their problem. They may as well hang a sign around their neck saying, I'm lying to you now because you can hear the way I talk. In the cases that you're describing, there's so much in television and media interviews that's simply dishonest. These little conversations you described having before you started the interview, and I know you must have experienced this. I know a lot of journalists who use those as a kind of a setup for a sucker punch. Put the smiley face on, oh, I love you, uh, Jordan, etc. Oh, yes, that's then, happened then as soon as <laughs> Then as soon as the lights go on, the, the lack of uh, integrity in these things is just savage. But those people, uh, maybe... Intellectuals, it's something like Orwell's famous thing, only an intellectual could believe it. It's sometimes it's only intellectuals who can't see the point. Educated in a formal sense, but not in a real sense. There's something so stupid that you had to be extremely intelligent to perform it. And news guys and news ladies who think that they can outcute the guest and get them. See, they're not, they're not, not even not, not going for a conversation. They've decided in advance that they're constructing a moment 
factitious is the recovery word for that. It's constructed. And they only want that. So you can be passing off the wisdom of Plato, Socrates, and Jesus in a single sentence. And they're still grinding in their heads. I have, I have the net ready. I'm going to drop it on them any minute. Not even listening to you. Mm -hmm. It's not an interview. It's a plot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I'm hoping that these long form videos are transformative. Um, I've interviewed a couple of, or interviewed, I've had a discussion with a couple of political figures, and that is going to continue, I hope. I believe that in a two hour discussion, you reveal yourself. I don't think you can help it. And you might reveal yourself as someone who's covering up so they can't, won't reveal themselves. Yeah, but that's I know. revealing in and of itself. It is. It is. I used to say that when, especially doing political interviews in Newfoundland, I remember one cabinet minister in particular said, well, he said, you asked me a lot. He said, but you never got me to say it. And I told him, I said, you're not saying it was the interview. Uh, you know, there's always a reality. Uh, and unfortunately now in, in public communications from when I started, and this is not nostalgia to the present moment, uh, the, the, the press have complete, not completely, so many of, of, of the press organs have just dropped uh, all the essential attributes of news gathering and information and have become partisans, have become propagandists, uh, are advancing agendas, all under, oh, we are the guardians of the democracy. Okay, well, so from the postmodern perspective, at least uh, how it's generally put forward with its neo-Marxist surround there's the proposition is something like all language games are games of power and so whether you think yeah. you're doing it or not you're putting forward an agenda and if you can't see that that's just a sign that that's you're proof. completely yeah so but now you made a distinction uh, between real journalism and this false journalism yeah. that you're decrying what do you think are the characteristics of genuine journalism well the first of it is the, the, the old bromide that everyone has a bias. Well, of course they have a bias. They have a life. Uh, but we talked at the very beginning of this for a long time about education. And what education is, uh, in another domain, is fashioning, deliberately fashioning your mind to be able to stand beside itself, to be able to stand outside and look at those things that by temperament or disposition or social situation, you have automatically come to accept. We have the power of self-scrutiny. And so let us, let me make an easy example. I, I love John Diefenbaker. I'm going, deliberately going back as a person, and I'm going to vote for him as a citizen. But I'm a journalist, and he comes to my town of St. John. And he does a bad stumble, and he makes an awful mess of this, and whatever. And I say to myself, well, oh, this is John Diefenbaker. I love him. So I'm going to hold that one back. Well, no, you're a journalist, and you say, uh, even though on a personal level, I'm going to go with him. I have the capacity to see that he really messed up here. This was stupid. This was wrong. So I'm going to report it. Uh, that's the interior of every person has control over their bias. And while we will never be perfect in expunging it, we all have a responsibility to examine where we are on our own personal domain. And if that's the case, then if you're covering politics, and you let yourself be agitated by the emotions of either hatred or love and do damage to the ones you hate and puff up the ones you love, you're lying. And the idea that you, because we all have bias, that therefore you go to the ridiculous extreme of not only indulging it, but injecting it into everything, every story and every story meeting that you have. Journalists want to have it both ways. I tell you what, one of the silliest phrases in Western journalism, is speaking truth to power. This is when I always go back to your hero, Solzhenitsyn. If you want to know what speaking truth to power is, have 10 years in, in Siberia, have a tyranny visit your family, that's speaking truth to power. These are sacred words. And you get it over here when someone makes a, a jab at, at, at Donald Trump. Dear God, it's a comedy. So... You were eight years with Here and Now? Uh, yeah, eight years in Newfoundland, every night, five, five uh, nights a week. 
and I traveled all over the province. You, right. So you're traveling everywhere. You're doing book reviews. You're doing uh, classical music reviews. So you're continuing your education in a major way. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's why I, I have one most that I'm not ashamed of. Uh, I, I've never stopped liking English literature. It wasn't the door that closed when you walked into the university. Uh, I'm reading Sir Thomas Brown right now. I read him 45 years ago, I suppose. Uh, I never... The enthusiasm and, and energy that comes from the best writers, you've adverted to the best, Matthew Arnold, the best that has been thought and said, uh, is still there. And that's an, almost a surprising thing, that even at, at this very nocturnal hour, uh, the kind of exuberance that you had at 20 still lingers in the chambers of music and literature. Well, that's something good. that's, yes, I would say so. Obviously, something um, indicating the lasting benefit of a, of a, yeah, of a genuine yeah. education in the humanities. It's, it's an inexhaustible source of, of what exactly? Well, we said mimicry of the great spirit that animates yeah, the yes. ages, right? How like could that way possibly you say that. get old? No, I, I like your description because that it's not often presented as that. And now, of course, the the idea that education is for the job. I do know how important jobs are. I come from Newfoundland, uh, but there's a set, whole set of spirits, as you know, you've met them, that also see that there's another target in education, and that's a, that you just spoke of it. You remember always, John, the better to enjoy life or the better to endure it. I don't think there's a better short description of what education is. No, I had a vision at one point of, of the people, many people who were influential to me in my life. These were, this particular vision mostly involved men. And, and so it was like a review in my mind of men that I had seen that had been influential to me. And then it was like there was something behind that that was the greater men that I had been exposed to yeah. as a... As a, as a student, the people I had read and identified with. I mean, when I found someone, a thinker that, I, that captured me, I tended to read everything I could that they had produced. And I would fall into their mode of thinking. It would take yeah. me over completely. And then I'd reemerge somewhat on the other side, huh. changed. But, but then I could see behind those great thinkers, there was something else. And I think that's something that, you know, people think about that as the ancestral god the, huh. the ancestral father, and, and that was the spirit that was shining through the great men I had read, and then all the people that had influenced me. It shone through what was great, uh, good and great about them. By the way, good, good and great, you're committing terrible sins here. These, these adjectives are now off, off, off limits. Uh, the idea of good and great, mathematics, this is where... The, 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 uh, well, it's the association. Aspects. It's the association with power. As soon as you buy the buy the doctrine that any hierarchical organization is predicated on power, then obviously the higher up you are in that hierarchy, the more corrupt you are. Yeah. So you might yeah. say, well, what's so what? What do you lose from that? Because you lose your sense of inferiority in relationship to the better. Well, what you lose is the better. Yeah. And that's fine <laughs> if you're good enough the way you are. And, but I've never met anyone who felt that they were good enough the way they were. There's always clamor inside your soul for more, the more that you could be. And where else are you going to find it except among those who have deemed, been deemed to be the best? And it, and it isn't arbitrary, right? You said when you went to university, you'd hear these words and they would hit you. You called them benign explosions. That's not indoctrination by your, by your no. educators. That's introduction no. to the benign explosions. Well, I, that particular professor, all he did, I, I can still hear it. Uh, it's about, a, I, I'm making a guess here, it's about a 42-line simile. He just read it. And I, I mean, it was like Beethoven's Fifth, because Milton does have a certain power of expression. And you're right, there was no message attached. He didn't say, even by the way, no message saying that you must like this. It was just done and let the spirit respond as the spirit will. But this this is this this fashioned education. This fashion you go to university now to to be to be injected with attitude, not thought. And some of these these white uh, programs and the, the new anti-racism, which is all identity, and and you only read things from the tribe to which you belong. That, I know enough about Newfoundland. I want to read about the Trojan War, <laughs> not the war on the southern shore. I mean, really, 
They're canceling Homer. They're canceling Shakespeare. They're making fun of mathematics. They're talking about white physics. I do not know how we wandered so easily into this terrible and dominating lunacy. Have you seen the latest statement by the president of the CBC, Catherine Tate, following the, 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 Lloyd, George, Lloyd, the George trial down in the States? I mean, it's like, it's like a parody of, of virtue thinking and how CBC is going to take notice of this and the systemic racism within the CBC and all that. Dear God. Uh, I, I, spine is, requires calcium and there's no milk in CBC. None. How did I get onto that? I'm not even sure. <laughs> all right. So you're, you're eight years in Newfoundland. You're traveling all over the province. You're, you're listening to people. You're watching yeah. their reactions to your shows. You're, you're reading. How much, are, how much do you read how, and habitually? Uh, oh, like that. Two, three, four hours a day. Uh, there was periods when I, I, I was out for a while. I could go for eight or nine. But I, I have books in the morning. I have books in the evening. And, of course, this, this stuff here, the Internet, uh, has diluted uh, some of that, that traffic, but I, I do have a fair store. I also, by the way, I, this is a good point to make for people who are going, uh, rereading, uh, as Nabokov has pointed out, you can't read a novel, you can only reread it. Uh, I find great pleasure. I reread Johnson's letters, for example, recently, uh, even The Anatomy of Melancholy, which is a bit of a task. Proust, reread. Uh, so I do that a lot. I, I find that it's a refreshing. Uh, that you borrow power, not power in, mm -hmm. in any militaristic or, or status sense. How about but authority? It, well, it teases your brain. And okay. uh, I, I, you, you, you get thrown into a mood in which the actions of the mind are more prompt and more precise. It's mood. You, you, can't, you can't claim, I, I will now say this. You have to mm -hmm. wait for the damn word to come to you. And but this puts you in that that fertile. Well, see, that's a mystery territory. too, right? That's a mystery. Yeah, it Th is that it element is. of thought, and you know, people uh, people are easily cynical about prayer, but it seems to me that there isn't much difference in posing a question to yourself and waiting for an answer than there is. I don't distinguish between that in some sense in prayer and prayer because. The, the act of receiving revelatory thought, which is the thought that bubbles up, is it seems to me that you pose yourself a question. And if your intent is genuine, you want the answer. You, you don't yes. want something comfortable, which is uncomfortable in itself. Mysteriously, the something will arise. And the less you put that persona that you describe between you and the source upon which you call, the more likely you are to be rewarded with the words that are correct. But yeah. Yeah. you that being you is a very strange idea because it it, it 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 happens of its own accord in some sense. It, it, the book I was referring to way back, and I said I wouldn't quote the title by Kessler, called The Act of Creation. And it was an analysis of uh, literary insight or literary inspiration, uh, humor, uh, the discovery of a punchline, and mathematical, uh, the eureka moment. I think I've read uh, that. I think I read that as an undergraduate. It, it's a long while ago, but it is, it is precisely your point. I, ha I have a puzzle in my mind. I, I'm trying to find a phrase, or if I'm a mathematician, I have a real puzzle. That you can make. And at a whole series of time, I have no answer. I can't get it. Uh, I go out and sloppily make a cup of tea. And as I'm stirring the first cube of sugar, oh, I got the answer. What was the difference between the two minutes before and the time that this thought exploded in your head? Mm -hmm. You had to have your mind prepared for the thought to have a place to pop out Okay, so of. you just used that phrase, explosion, again. You talked about the benign yep. explosions that Introduction to Literature set off. Okay, so there's a thematic relationship between those two ideas. And yep. we already talked about the idea of mimicry. And so, you know, what you do in part when you're educating yourself by pursuing what's See, what appears to you to be meaningfully and true is you build that spirit inside of you. That's it. And then that's the thing that's informing you when you ask questions. Yeah. And you should build that spirit out of, you build that spirit out of what the best, out of the best the past has to offer you. And there's markers for that. And the markers are that aesthetic, that aesthetic yes. uh, grip, right? It's not something that someone can impose on you. It doesn't work. It has to no, be, it you meet it halfway. And so, one, you know, when we have a conversation like this, that, that's spontaneous, 
what I'm trying to do when I have a conversation like this is to become transparent in some sense. I don't want my concerns about the podcast, let's say the quality of the podcast, the audience, any of that. I don't want those proximal concerns to interfere with my immersement in the conversation. And if I do that correctly and open myself up, then there's a spontaneity about the dialogue. And that seems to be associated with the search for and the discovery of some additional truth. We have to, <clears throat> persona was one of the words that, that classic phrase, to prepare to face, to meet the faces that you meet. Anytime we artificially or self-consciously construct ahead of time some personal interaction, which is what a conversation really is, if we go in with the scaffolding already prepared in there, it's kind of an armor, nothing can happen. Uh, you, have, you have put yourself in, in, in a closed container and you've done the right ritual moves. Your other point is also very interesting. You don't care about the damn podcast and the quality. No, don't. Don't. These are not only, these are secondary, they're collateral, they're adventitious. But if you want to have a chat, make the chat the thing. And even there, you don't, you don't make it too deliberate. You just, you sit, you speak, and back and forth. I don't know, by the way, how I'm doing on this, but that's not the point. <clears throat> Excuse me. The point on this one is very simple, that we have to allow some channel for the impulses that we don't understand, call them the unconscious, call them, in, call them sensibility, the impulses that we, we don't command, but they are there and occasionally they emerge, you know, like solving the problem, having a conversation, making a quick joke in the middle of a live conversation. It's a great mysterious thing. We're, we're not nearly as metaphysical as we should be. Uh, and people should pay more attention to the spirit, even if they're not religious, because there's a whole aura. I go back to that word again. There's a whole aura around how we do things and how and we why are. Why do you use? Why do you 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 have used that word continually? Why yeah. why aura? What what is it that, well, that that's magical about that conceptualization? Well, 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 two things. In that it is ineffable. That's the first thing. That it is it is a sheen or a halo effect, but it is not not to be seen by the eye. But there is, from some center, or maybe it's not a center, maybe maybe it's a side, but from some place, we derive psychological and intellectual energy uh, that we can't command, but that in, in some ways we can prepare for, as you have said, by stocking the mind as best you can. There are elements in our areas of the highest thought that are structured logically, and uh, research and all of these, but there's one other thing besides. And I call it aura mainly because of its insubstantiality, its invisibility, but also its link to something that's close to magic or close to religion. And you can choose either of those two terms. So there's there, uh, the phrase that leapt to mind when you were describing that was the preparation of the temple for receipt of the divine revelation. And well, I studied, I, I spent a lot of time reading Carl Rogers, Carl Rogers, a psychologist, a counselor, clinical psychologist, a humanist, but originally a Christian seminarian, deeply influenced by Protestantism. And he, he wrote very deeply and practically about listening and talking to clients. And, and he insisted upon a certain kind of genuineness that if you were operating properly as a therapist, that there were no, no persona tricks. You were fully there, yeah. you were integrated, body and mind integrated. And there's something about that. It's things have to line up all the way down to the bottom properly. And the more that happens, the, the better the quality of the revealed word. It's something like yeah. that. And you prepare that in part by exposing yourself to great thoughts because they also Yes, eradicate the, yes, the dross and, and the dead wood and, and the impediments to that movement of thought upward. And so while you're reading all the time and pulling in these great thoughts and the spirit that animates the great thoughts as well, you're also feeding that part of you that responds when you call yeah. upon yourself to answer a question. It's why I've stressed in my writings, honesty in speech, because you... You have to rely on this capacity for creative revelation to, to guide you through the darkest possible times of your life when you have nothing else to guide you. If you've corrupted yourself with deceptive speech and therefore deceptive thought, you won't 
that that won't be there won't be anything there that's reliable when you call on it yeah. desperately. Yeah, I saw that you you made that point. I think in one of your uh, recent comments, it doesn't matter where, where you point out that some people go to university and they say, "Okay, I'm going to bend uh, to the current dilapidated regime. I'm going to pretend that I." I adore all their sanctities, but as soon as I get out of university and I got the goddamn piece of paper, uh, then I'm going to start fighting back. And you wrote back or replied, if you start lying and you make a habit of it, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, uh, you won't walk out as easy as you think. And you either, you either start from that point or you don't. And if, if you if you make that your persona, sometimes the persona takes over the person. Uh, that Oscar Wilde is familiar with that. Uh, one other thing I'd like to add, just to throw in there, when you talk about getting so close to truth, remember also words themselves as words. Uh, if there is a place for enchantment and enthrallment and charm, uh, Orpheus with his lute made trees, remember, the, that he could communicate with inanimate music in that case, but language also. I think one of the highest or hardest sentences in all righty, is the very first one there. In the beginning was the word. Uh, I mean, you, words are actors. Uh, we have major control over them, I think, but they have an internal, they have an internal force. They have a residual force. They are magical, uh, hence poetry, hence Ecclesiastes, Book of Job. You know them better than I. Uh, I don't know if we ever penetrated that, but I do know that language in its individual terms, in its actual words, uh, has latencies of, 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 of disposition and force. Yes, it's right to think of them as active agents. Yeah. I'd like to hear you on that. So you watch every word and you watch every phrase and you watch every sentence and you try to get the rhythm right and you try to get the harmony right and yeah. you you then you attack what you wrote and you see if it can withstand the assault that you can bring to it and maybe you do that 50 times to see if you can craft something that you cannot improve no matter how hard you try and that you can't break no matter what you bring to bear upon it. Well, again, as I said, I... I Sometimes a very simple sentence. I mean, I, how can I, how could I explain or explicate would be better that particular sentence? In the beginning was the word. It's, they're all single syllables, prepositions, a definite article, and in the beginning was the word. There's always again, there's there's always that extra outside uh, contribution that comes from the language itself and putting. I, I sometimes think the Kabbalists, the great tradition of the Kabbalists, the, the minute examination of the of the intrinsic terms, uh, the individual letters. Uh, it may seem like a superstition, but I I, I I think of it less a superstition than as a kind of mildly encouraged path to a certain insight. There, there is more things in heaven and earth than I dreamt of in our philosophy. Uh, I, I wish the universities, again, go back to our theme here, it seems to go through, in dealing with literature in particular and history, those kinds of subjects uh, would, would pay much more attention to also giving their, their students the capacity uh, to imitate those writers. The best writer in America, in certain ways, is Abraham Lincoln. Isn't that an amazing thing? Uh, his inaugural addresses, oh my Lord. They had power enough that when Martin Luther King came by some hundred or so years later, that they were operating in his brain. They were, they were a living dynamic. Every drop of blood drawn by the lash should be paid for one drawn by the sword. Uh, it, you know, once we acknowledge that words continue to have their, some of their original dynamic, if they had been placed uh, in the mind, and if they're kept up. Anyway, I, I know I'm rambling, and I'm slightly more than incoherent. We tell our students, right, we should tell our students just what you're telling them now, which is that you watch your reaction to the words, and you note the awe that's generated spontaneously, and you take note of the worship that you've just participated in uh, despite yourself as the marker to what constitutes truth. Well, I, th I think you have it. Uh, 
Uh, we will never fully comprehend the operations of, of our own full consciousness. Uh, either it's, 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 it's beneficial or non-beneficial. But we do know that spirit, the spirit, whether religious or however you want to describe it, that there are elements that will not be put down in the account book because they cannot be tabulated and they cannot be named, at least at this point. Uh, you're in a, in, in a clinical circumstance, you're partly a scientist, and you will, we will go as far as the evidence can lead you in the physical properties. But there are aspects and dynamics of all human action that come from inspiration, the, the word put in, inspiration to breathe. Uh, the demon that you refer to in all creation, we, we, the ancient poets thought that, or ancient philosophers, that the poets were possessed. Well, they were possessed. Something for, for a while, Herman Melville, great example, 25, 26 years old, and produces what is probably the only text, I'm using an 80s word, the only text that could be placed pretty close to a Bible. He flooded his mind. His mind was a volcano for about a year and a half that he did write. He never wrote like it after, he never equaled it. Anyone who reads, and by the way, he was fired by the Bible, by Shakespeare, and by Milton. These are, I'm confirming what you've said so often here. Uh, you get in touch with the best, and the best get in touch with you. Uh, it's just, again, it's a, it's a marvelous field. That's also the a way, terrifying thing. It's a terrifying thing that a real university education or real education introduces people to because there's some terrible fire that's associated oh, with yeah. the best. Because it does burn off everything in you that isn't worthy, and that, and that tends to be an awful lot. Well, in my, in my case, it's everything, so <laughs> don't bring the match close. <laughs> so, okay, so you're eight years with Here and Now, and then what happens? Uh, odds and ends of things. Uh, one thing that is probably going to be interesting for the public side here is that at one point in my own flaws, I was out of work, and I, I, I'm going to subtract a lot of detail because time only. I ended up as uh, an executive assistant to the opposition leader for about 17 months. And I wrote question period for the Newfoundland Assembly. I wrote it for the caucus. Uh, and because it was Newfoundland, I got inside. I didn't want to do this, by the way. Uh, I dreaded uh, accepting the political appointment, but I wasn't working, so I did. On, and in hindsight, it was one of the most useful things I've ever done because apart from being the guy on the mountainside with binoculars staring at the bird, you're actually in the damn room. I, I heard what politicians think of journalists. I heard what journalists, obviously, think of politicians. Uh, there's a 30% ignorance ratio on both sides and uh, never been cured. But it also really educated me, sensitized me uh, to what, what are the buttons that you press if you, were, if you go back to the journalists. Uh, then I ended up writing some stuff, and I did this a, a piece I did on Newfoundland in particular, the fishery. This, this was the, I uh, somehow or other struck a chord rather widely. And suddenly. This when the cod stocks were collapsing? The, this was the account. This was of, what years? What years was this? Uh, 1992, 93 would probably be, I, I may be off on a year or two, but the, that was it. I did a half hour. It was right, the so year also. Newfoundland had an unparalleled wealth of. Of fishery and miraculous uh, well, in its it, bountifulness that was decimated entirely and has never that, recovered. It is it is the entire reason that it exists. The language comes out of the fishery. This this the nature of the settlements, all those small places where they went there because it was a beach and a place to fish. The sense of humor, the stoicism that you will find in some, uh, certainly the inventiveness in song and chat, because you were you were really isolated. And people met only on the water. There was so much tied up with that. That that, that collapse was as much psychologically. For the first time in 500 years, you couldn't take a codfish out of the water. So I did a piece on that. And, and as I said, it obviously struck some chords. And the next thing I knew, I was being offered three or four jobs in various places. Well, I read of, of cod schools that were 300 miles long, hundreds of feet deep, yeah. hundreds of miles wide, and composed primarily of fish that were three to five feet long. That were so plentiful you could haul them up in buckets. That was the yeah, that was the that was the original cod fishery. 
You, it was a joke. You could walk across harbors on the backs of cotton. No, it was. And it, by the way, this, the sustenance for, in active terms, 300 years of all these wonderfully small places, it, that also nourished because they were truly cut off. I keep saying this. You were in Pacentia Bay, you weren't in Fortune Bay, and you weren't in St. Mary's Bay. And therefore, being so isolated, the drive to make things, uh, either for utility or for recreation, uh, to invent practices. They brought mumming over from, mummering over from England. Uh, folk song. Some of the Newfoundland folk songs as literature have not been studied, but they are so inventive. Even a list of names, uh, Kelly Rousseri, you try to do it yourself. So it, it did follow. also kind of fostered by force independence. <laughs> there wasn't too many other people around to help you. So if you don't do it yourself, you're going to be in a hard spot. It had a lot of virtues, but it had a lot of faults. And the lack of health and education being the two principal ones. How many futures were amputated because you grew up in a place where there was no school and there was no health? How many, you know, this, this is Thomas Gray in the, in the English churchyard. How many mute and glorious Miltons? It was hard, it was cruel, but it was rich was rich in things, again, uh, that individuals and communities. And so what were you writing? Things. What were you writing that caused such a stir? I, I just, I wrote it, looking back at it now, it was basically an elegy. I called it On People's Shores. And that comes from another point. Uh, was it, here the tide flows and here they ed, ebb, not with that dull, unsinewed tread of waters that move along on peopled shores. That's a poem written in 1930 about Newfoundland. And I, basically, I was simply stating that the soul, and I mean it, soul of Newfoundland was being blistered and evaporated uh, once you kill the cultural, economic, linguistic source of the being of the place. I go. So it was just reckoning. We talked mainly to fishermen that, that poet I met on the north, northeast, uh, on St. Anthony's at uh, Lansom Meadow. Uh, it, farmers, by the way, this is a good point to make. Farmers gave it the most response on most letters that I've ever received. And I wonder why. You know, fishermen are not farmers. So very simple. Their, their grandfathers had received uh, salt fish from the Newfoundlanders in the dirty 30s when, they, when the Perry Dust Bowls and uh, all the drought was going on. Newfoundland, which was then just a country, somehow got barrels of salt fish over to the prairie farmers. They remembered it. And when they saw the fishery collapse, I'm serious. I, thousands of, these were letters, not emails. You had to actually write and stamp them. And three quarters of them were from the prairies. I, I always thought that when I learned that, I thought that was a nice thing to, to kind of associate with Canada. The understories are much better than the newspapers. What kind of consequences were there for, for that writing? Uh, it was a point where the story met someone who basically, I mean me, uh, met the person who was close enough to it to do it some justice. But it was the voices, on, I'm not one of these shy boys. It was the voices uh, of, of the fishermen that I interviewed and also some officials. It all, it, it, it dropped into a harmony, 22 or 23 minutes that you really see. I'm not bragging, just stating. And because, uh, most Canadians, this is again, despite the apologetics that come out every single damn day from Ottawa about how miserable and hateful we are, uh, the national disposition in the main, it's not confined to any group either, is you know, a reasonably lively interest in the bearings of other people. And when they're having a hard time, uh, if there's any way we can intercede or at least offer you verbal comforts, uh, we're going to do it. And when the farmers, farming and fishing are very much like in some ways, small farm, inshore fishery and in, in the family farm. They saw it and uh, their, their native, their, their identity as citizens. That's what I want to say. Their identity as citizens uh, was the preeminent one of that moment. And when I think of identity politics, I often ask, and I think I, it should be asked a lot more. When you go to university, your identity there is student. 
And when you go to a university or you go to the your identity there is public servant. The idea that you can concentrate your being into one small superficial attribute uh, is, is nonsense. But the effect on me was uh, I ended up here. I came up here. Again, I'm not good, not good on dates, 94, 95. And, it's and here is continue. Toronto. Yeah, it's continuous yeah, so you run. Moved from the periphery, so to speak, from yeah, completely uh, different culture absolutely. to Toronto. Absolutely. What happens when you move to Toronto? Uh, not a lot. Uh, as I said, by that time, both parents had gone. Um, I had the, the, the job at the national uh, commentary and interviews and stuff and at uh, CBC Radio. But uh, I was introduced to a degree I had never been before to the full play of politics in a really large province, Ontario, 10 million. And because I was working at the national, uh, politics on the national scale. And uh, I also, here's another small dimension. I, I somehow ended up being reasonably popular as, as a speaker, all sorts of things. And that gave me more opportunities, not financial, they were, they were financial too. But I ended up in so many places, addressing so many different groups, everything from fishermen to academics to nurses to librarians. And over a 20 year period, uh, this dropped me in and out of a hell of a lot of places and met a, a tremendous host of different people, different occupations. Uh, there's a second. Well, that would be uh, part of the reason why, in some sense, you have a national voice, right? Because all those people that you've met, they echo inside of you in the same way that the yeah. books that you've read echo inside of you. I think the traveling under those auspices, because you always, uh, you couldn't, your schedule was too thick. But I, I could always, almost always linger for a day or two. Uh, and the various associations. Uh, also, by the way, here's another thing. Public speaking is, is a great pleasure, uh, and it's a bit of an art. And I was fortunate at this stage uh, to be given other stages in which to keep practicing it. You know, again, you've done hundreds, but you, if I did 30 or 40 a year. Uh, you, you learn the arts of public communication. That's a great, great, great bit of fun, by the way. And uh, you take it, but you're right on that thing, that getting across the countries, seeing how Alberta is different from British Columbia, New Brunswick is different from Northern, I, I can go on. This, this country is, is fluid. Uh, it has an underlying sentiment, Pache, Mr. Trudeau. Uh, there are core values in Canada, uh, and they should be stood up and, and emphasized a hell of a lot more. But this was, again, this is the second part to practical education. Uh, you get out, you're not in Toronto all the time. And while I don't dump on Toronto, per se, uh, if you get within its charm circle, uh, you become uh, one of the mental herd. The set of synonymous attitudes uh, among the cognoscenti and journalists in this city uh, is appalling. And I think that's reflective of something that happens in the, in the, in the North American culture, yeah. at least as far as the United States and Canada are concerned. Yep. That also happens at the level of the intellectual elite. And there seems to be something like a, a very distinct sense of contempt that emanates from that. It's certainly something that people who aren't in Toronto react to react what identify with Toronto and react against. And it, it, it is it is the kind of irritation that drives the populism, for example. Yes, exactly. Made Donald Trump so popular. It's exactly. I've seen that in the contempt that reviewers continually express for my hypothetical followers. Like, I don't think I have followers. I think I have viewers and watchers and readers and. And even if they were the people they're parodied to be, I don't see any real sin in communicating with them in, in, an, in, in whatever capacity I can manage. But there's always a dripping contempt that is, that is yeah. associated with the hoi polloi, let's say, who, you know, need such bromides and so forth. Well, it's very true. I mean, in, in your particular case, uh, uh, is low, low, low intelligence snobbery. Uh, uh, kind of absolutely brazen snark by people, again, I don't need to flatter you, they haven't read as much, don't know as much, but it is a verification of their standing within this little particular guarded sect. Uh, and the opinions here have to be the only opinions. It's almost like Bloomsbury 
at, at a heavily discounted level. Uh, I was I often hear I, I wondered in your case too, in the very very beginning, when the University of Toronto was sending you those letters, I, I kept asking, well, what's the point of tenure? If all these great tenured uh, professors at the University of Toronto, when one of their own is being disparaged and to some degree threatened by these in employment terms, why why aren't I out on the principle? Uh, it seems to have just gone away. And I don't know if that's I don't think that's particularly Toronto mentality, but it's certainly that. Uh, no, there's been basically radio silence from my colleagues. Let's yeah, say. it is. Or, it is. It's, yeah. it's very strange. Even even the level of success of the books, I mean, any serious engagement review, uh, full scale of, of any of the three, uh, doesn't take place. And, they, and, they, and then the, uh, the, the kind of agitated morons on Twitter uh, dropping their low IQ bombs from a great height. I don't know why this is the case. It's, it, it, makes you, it makes you melancholy. And I don't know if we're going to be able to fix it, actually. I, I wonder how far we can go along these paths before we degrade and degenerate. Well, what uh, have you seen elements. happening? What have you seen happening? You've, you've been observing our country yeah. and the culture yeah. for a long, long time. And yes, you don't have. have any particular axe to grind, as far as no, I can I tell. So what what's happening in the cultural sphere, as far as you've concerned, over the last, say, well, pick a point and, and move I'd forward. Say that, I would say the last 10 or 15, we, we know origins, and I won't go through all that. We know about the 60s. But in terms of uh, visible... Uh, evidentiary uh, impact, it's the last 10 or 15. Uh, the first thing that I've seen that I resent is the idea uh, tacitly held, never explicitly made public, uh, that there are certain perspectives on the world that are okay, and we hold them, and therefore we're better, and any dissent from them or disagreement with them or an alternate set is not to be, not to be allowed. Half the reason I'll give an illustration. Half the reason the CBC audiences collapsed and shrunk to such a vast extent they did is that CBC was only interested in talking to the people who agreed with it. And that's a much more narrow bunch than ever. Well, I've so watched first... my parents and, and their reaction to CBC. I mean, we were avid CBC listeners yeah. when I was a kid, especially to FM. And and it was everywhere in Canada, and but also, yeah. of course, television as well. But radio, we'll concentrate on radio. It was always of high quality and it did seem to speak to the whole country it did a credible yeah. job as it's na a national broadcaster and then all of a sudden and it is probably 15 years ago everyone i know in the west just stopped listening it was like no this isn't us anymore it, it folded up and went away i can tell you that uh, i'm not, not rear guarding attacking them uh, i i waged a small minor almost silent rebellion within. I tried to get something out there. Whenever I was traveling in the last 10 or 15 years, it was the most frequent phrase I'd ever hear. I'm not watching it anymore. I'm not watching it anymore. And it's accelerated greatly. Uh, the events in the States, uh, Mr. Trump's election, maybe to a degree Brexit over across the water, has, has become attended with or is present simultaneously with this new uh, wokeness, this critical race theory, the imposition of anti-bias, uh, the hyper, and I think, affected sensitivity of the business university and even the health community to the more fashionable virtue contests. Mr. Trudeau uh, apologizing almost every six days. I've, I've written three or four columns saying, if you do these apologies, go right ahead. We have our faults, but every now and then find something good to say. We have stripped the nation of its self-confidence. That's one thing. Uh, we have alienated and put out uh, in the outer darkness a vast portion of the population. They are not listening to its cultural leaders or the Illuminati or the clerisy. Uh, people are afraid. A political correctness is a very feeble phrase to cover the psychological landscape in which people uh, of moral character are afraid to say what is extremely obvious. Uh, we're polluting uh, the, the political system and the intellectual system. And finally, aside from you, uh, on a large scale, aside from you, no one is resisting this, 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 this tidal force uh, that is emphatically cheapening the culture and shatter, not shattering, by piecemeal graduation. 
Canada, the I idea of the centrality people, is gone. J Janice Fiamengo is oh, yeah, I know. Gad Absolutely. Saad is yes. forthright. Um, Bruce Party, law professor at Queen's, has been a, a, what would you say, a truthful communicator with me. Uh, and LA. I also like David Solway, uh, Janice Fiamengo's husband. He writes some very strong stuff. Okay, so you've seen this, and you don't think it's just the miasma of a cranky old man? I mean, that's... No, no, no. Okay, why not? Uh, and, and what do you uh, well, think about the Trudeau government, just out of curiosity? <laughs> I, and uh, I don't uh, mean, I don't really mean politically, I mean culturally. I know, I know. Because you've looked at so many governments, and you, you, you do seem to me to be someone who gives out praise when praise is due and I, criticism. I certainly, when criticism. Hope so. I certainly hope I do on the praise front. Uh, two, three, two or three things. Uh, there is, in the, in the case of Trudeau, uh, not on the partisan level. I think his view of Canada is not only wrong, that it has no core values and that there's no nonsense. Uh, I, I, I vehemently uh, am against the propaganda side of, of his thing. He, all his private, meaning personal, all his private so-called commitments, to this farcical global warming on being the worst, but also he adopted despite his own personal stuff, he adopted the woke persona to the nth possible degree. And why do you uh, say he adopted that persona rather than being it? I mean, do you, do you think that's calculated? Uh, uh, Is there something uh, uh, under? I, I don't know, Trudeau. Is there, any, like, do you know I him know. personally at all? Do you Have uh, you ever talked to him when he oh, wasn't? Oh, yeah. I, I had one hour session, but I, I, I'm not basing the remarks on that. What, what I will base it on is that, and I'm not trying to be harsh without cause, that if for some reason it was fashionable to have exactly the other set of opinions, the opposite, they would be just. I think he, the, the one thing that in his biography that makes sense is at least that little inclination towards dramatics. He's not a very good actor, but he knows what roles are playing best. And because the conservatives are such a, 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 a self contradictory and disorganized and leaderless bunch. It's enough to be half good on the proscenium uh, to maintain it. But the worst thing about, and I should say this, we have fractions in the yeah, fractions in the West. Uh, we have great disenchantments. We have economic ruin facing some problems after this COVID thing. Uh, we have a generational tension set up between the woke and, and a lot of other people. And he is so much on one side of all of these things. And it, there emerges from his government and his ministers a smugness uh, about any opposition. I, I can't think of a time when Canada, in a, in a kind of soft way, uh, was in such a possibility of, of of losing its own confidence and of you know, shoulders back, as you say. Uh, this country, bit by bit by bit, is shedding uh, the sense of its own integrity and drifting. And politics is, is so shallow these days. I wish, I wish, I wish you could ever hear. A, you don't have, there's no oratory because there's no truth. You can't build a great speech around something you don't really believe in. And by the way, here's, I'll toss it back to you. We are a nation. When was the last time you heard a national address? You know, meant to underline and, and, well, and give you emphasis. As you said, though, if there's no national identity... What's to address? Yeah. Or if yeah. the national identity is essentially something like tyrannical power and oppression, and yeah. to be fought at every possible, um, what every possible corner by every possible means, what can you possibly address? Yeah. And also the factionalism of identity politics is directly contradictory. Uh, it, it, it seeks to to suffocate the idea of commonality and citizenship. That's another. That's a huge worry. In the in the in the name of anti-racism, I see some of these tactics and some of the demonizations and some of the insults as provoking the very cause that they seem to be against. We got to stop fascinating on the color of people's skin, which is what identity politics sometimes just turns into. Uh, I have never seen a time when the, our country in 2021. I, I wrote a column about this. Is not systemically racist. I was in Newfoundland when the Americans landed in 9-11. I interviewed some of them. You know, they didn't have any problem with background, color of skin, or anything else. 
the normal reflex of the normal Canadian. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And yet we have people like Mr. Trudeau, Catherine Tate at the CDC. She accuses her own organization of being systemically racist. Mr. Trudeau says the parliament does not just happen to be like that. It was planned to be like are we mid medieval, you know, flagellants? Is this, is this the new, the new patriotism? That's why I, that's just my deepest problem with Mr. Trudeau. He's not as large as the nation that he seeks or seems to think he's governing. Well, I'm still struggling constantly to understand this, uh, to see, to see, because it does seem to me to have accelerated in the last few years, whatever this is that is yeah. accelerating. I mean, in, increasingly, the pathology that has decimated the humanities in particular, which is the core of the university, and you you know, it's self-punitive in some sense, because enrollment in the humanities is plummeting, right? It's just catastrophically declining. And so you might say, well, if the motivation was resentment of the creative process that produced the great classics, then victory has been attained. Yeah, the classics yeah. have been decimated and everyone, no one will attend to them anymore. And so, you know, victory. But it means the death of the universities as far as I'm concerned. And then, but worse than that, and, and I could see this happening five or six years ago, is that this is starting in a yes. very major way to percolate out into the broader culture. Oh, and so you see absolutely. this in schools, every faculties of education in particular should hang their heads in utter shame. What they've done to the education system is beyond disgraceful and it's barely got going. And you see this in the corporations too. I see these corporations, they, yeah. they fall over themselves, kowtowing yep. to their HR departments to bring in a philosophy that is um, explicitly anti-capitalist yeah absolutely. it's like what are you people doing it's like do, do you think you're going to be able to pick and choose bits of this philosophy once you open the door no you i, I just can't believe that that i can't believe well we're we're on the same page there uh it is it is inexplicable uh from the schools uh i've, I've seen the material from some of the schools not because it was passed on to me uh, some of the training sessions, the idea that a human being with any self-respect would submit to anti-bias training. Who the hell are you to tell me what, that I'm unconsciously biased? I, I, the, 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 the weakness and cowardice of the big corporations. We don't even see. know what those tests measure. I know people you know, who do they, they serious do research on those t tests. It's not obvious what that bias consists of. It's the cultural revolution in China. And who is the ignorant fool that has the, all this expertise? Does she or he have cultural bias? Well, if it's unconscious, how the hell do you... Look, a nation of citizens wouldn't accept this. You don't go into a, a shop as an employee or a big firm or a law firm and let some jerk in her human or tell you take the sensitivity training. Who in the hell are you? I went to church. I went to school. That's what gives me my personality. So that's some corporate fool. But no, everyone, shoulders down, head under the desk. Uh, that's the biggest worry. I, I, I think we're at the back end uh, of, of some deliquescence, some, 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 some melting uh, of things that we knew and we knew had they, they had value. Maybe we're so well off. We were being shielded from my, on this side of the world, from the great wars and from poverty and from huge natural disasters. Uh, our, our ancestors had built the place up for our benefit, and we waltz in, and we're full of life and vigor, and we can go places. So you, you get you get lazy and complacent, and you let these 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 mice uh, of thought take over the building. Uh, but after a while, as you said, you can't you can't taste a bit of this. You have to take it all. And I, I, Mr. Tudor should be fighting this, not underlining and endorsing it. And so what, what, let's talk about the conservatives momentarily. Ah. I mean, they can't organize themselves. They, ah. they don't have a story that's compelling. Nope. I mean, this isn't just a problem that's distinct to Canada. I no, mean, the, the, uh, the inability of centrists to generate a romantically compelling narrative is universal across the West, as yeah. far as I can see. And so, it. I mean, it. It. Pre, I presume that Trudeau will win the next election. I don't know what you think. I think that, uh, barring some some Easter scale uh, miracle, he will win. Uh, Mr. O'Toole 
the most recent thing he did was to embrace this 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 superstitional folly of apocalyptic global warming and promise his own carbon tax. All of his MPs are from Alberta and Saskatchewan. I, I, and there are, there's one or two people in the in the Conservative Party of real talent. Rhetorically, there's no one matching. Uh, uh, I think the same just suddenly slipped away. Uh, Pierre Polyver. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, no. Uh, they consent to the things. Do I should talk to Pierre? I think he's very, very good. Uh, again, I, I'm not other partisan. people have people, suggested. People think that I am partisan. I am not. Uh, I'd be just as hard if it was a. But Polyver, uh, I have. Uh, I don't know him. I have talked with him. Uh, he's organized. Yeah, he, his seven-minute speeches in Parliament are very, very good. Uh, he agitates the other side greatly. They hate him as opposed to don't like him. Uh, he would have been a much more convincing, depressed that despises him, which is another medal of Canada uh, in his favor. So, yeah, he would be a very good. He's, he's articulate as hell. I don't know much about him as such, but I watched the performance. And in the case of public life, performance is everything. So let's let's end this by we didn't walk through your whole life, but we we walked through your education. Much of a, so I'm I haven't happy got about much of that. a life, Jordan. Go right ahead. Um, journalism. What was it like when you were younger, and and what's happened, and and where do you see hope, perhaps? I think it was uh, for most people that go into it who actually intended or intent. Uh, with intent, went after a journalism career. Yeah, fine. Uh, I knew a lot of the editors of really small town newspapers. There's about eight or nine of them in Newfoundland when I was there. Uh, Harbor Grace, uh, uh, St. Anthony's, Clarenville, and the, the, the old hometown reporter. And these are small towns. Uh, they were fun. Uh, they were, that, that was their but they of course, either eviscerated or, or folded up so long. St. John's wasn't a particularly good newspaper town, but at least they actually reported the news. They didn't go out and seek out causes and stick up things that whatever would reflect this cause would be on the newspaper. They know it was the event. It was the car crash. It was the election. It was some foreign thing. It was something that actually happened, and we report things that happen that are new. Uh, we don't see ourselves as a running channel trying to bend the mind of our readers. Jump 30, 40 years. Uh, in the States, it's absolutely toxic. Nothing outside of Soviet Russia when it was Soviet Russia, and Pravda was the screen of all lies. Journalism in the United States, on all the big networks, everyone goes on about Fox. Have you ever watched CNBC? Have you ever watched CNN? I mean, you'd, you'd need a mental cleanser if, if you were in the same room. They, they, they are ruinously corrupt. They are ruinously incompetent. Some of their anchors are stupid. I mean, stupid in the sense that they had to work hard to get as stupid as they are. And then you have the newspapers who decide, well, Trump is such an evil that we have to change the entire doctrine of what a newspaper is. We are out to get him. When newspapers become activists, it's time to walk to the cemetery and bury the, the, the printing presses. Uh, so how much, press, of that, Rex, how much of that do you think is, is merely a consequence, merely a consequence of technological revolution? I mean... There's so much journalism now It's it, because anyone can pick up a pen and, and have an in, instant international audience if they can attract it, right? You can yeah. blog, you can yeah. do YouTube videos. It's like no one has a monopoly on bandwidth anymore. And no. so the newspapers and, and, and classical journalists are really up against it in a, in a profound way. I mean, are we just seeing the consequences? No, of, no. Uh, no you think it's more than that? No, no, no. I, I know it's more than that. I, I'm being defined here now. I know that journalists uh, in the higher altitudes, national journalists especially, uh, they now see themselves uh, as procurators, as, as persons as prestigious, to some degree at least, as those they report upon. They also have invested themselves with a clerical view of things, that they have a wisdom that perhaps even the people they're reporting on are, are, are incapable of receiving. They are there to teach you. Uh, CBC, uh, from my perspective, lost its audience mainly because it became a preacher. And the, 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 the chief characteristic... Yeah, boring preacher. 
which is even oh, worse. Oh, you, you, you have hit so many nails on the head with that. You do not need Salmonex if the CBC is on these days. But no, journalists have self-appointed. This is the problem. Let's take the trans movement. Suddenly, they, they can, in three days, they can put this particular issue, which at best uh, exists at a micro level in terms of the whole population, and make that the new, the, 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 the new litmus test, uh, you know, for whether you're politically correct or not. They endorse all ideological programs of the hard left. And, and I also, I'll say this, many journals and journalists don't like their own audiences or the people who read them. Uh, don't, I, like I said about the humanities, if you're thinking about becoming a journalist, please look around a bit more before you do. Although those that do it very well, as I said, Glenn Greenwald, Molly Hemingway, Melanie Phillips, I'm going around the globe with these. Uh, these are sterling examples of what we would hope. Well, it seems that people like that are increasingly, I would say, going out there on their own. Yeah, they are. They are. Melanie Phillips, I do know, uh, has her own thing set up. Greenwald got tossed because he wasn't subscribing to the current philosophy, but he had enough standing that his intercept, I think it's the intercept, uh, is now, and he gets a lot of airtime because, again, he, he is, I hate the term, uh, a celebrity journalist, but he's a good journalist. I disagree with 95% of what he thinks, but I, I see him covering the press lately, uh, uh, the last five or six months of some of his columns. They are, as they say, must read. And Barry Weiss's letter, uh, the, the, that's also good stuff. So there are good people there, but I think the weight culturally with the universities, the corporations, uh, the news media itself, the trend towards the enforcement, uh, tacit or by mob, of a certain set of thoughts is so deep and is so unresisted by so many that I, I think we're in for a long haul. And mm -hmm. if we have a bad economy coming out of COVID mm -hmm. and all the spending, mm -hmm. It's going to be a terrible two or four years. There are so many people, and it's not being reported. Lost shops, lost jobs, lost hope, saw, saw life enterprise collapse. Uh, and we're, are you seeing this on the news? No, you're not. Anyway, I don't mean to, I don't mean to always to end up screaming at you. What makes you optimistic? Any, any flare uh, of independence. Uh, I'm not as convinced that some of the brilliant writing that is being done in analysis and opposition is reaching enough people, but I am encouraged that there's a lot. I, mean, I can't go through the whole span. There's a lot out there if you, if you search it out. I don't know if this would be classified as optimism, but when societies get really challenged, I mean really challenged, inevitably they revert to the genuine virtues. Uh, if this current malaise has set us back really badly, and if Canada is no longer uh, a place that has instant access to almost everything it wants, maybe its citizens will learn again the, the eternal values of intercommunication of commonality of goals and values, not skin colors or ideologies. And that uh, getting closer to reality, if we are forced to it by economics or other things, we will dispense with, we both, we all be both that all this is hollow and useless, but it's like, a, you know, you can afford to play if you've got everything else taken care of. If we're driven back to actually having to work for things, think about things, take time, and uh, avoid falsity, th these these will blow up in the, in the day. Whether that's going to happen, uh, I kind of doubt it, but maybe that is the the, the the cynicism of senescence creeping up on me. You've had a stellar career as a journalist. You've had the sort of career that I would say every journalist would like to have. Um, You've been prolific and influential and well-regarded and controversial, and, and you've had a long life doing it and done all sorts of interesting things. What advice would you have for someone who wants to write? Well, what do they I, have well, to do? If they want to write, and, and particularly if they want to be journalists who write, 
go to the best examples. One of the, every journalism school in the country should have the two volumes of Malcolm Muggeridge's biography. I do this for two reasons. I know your veneration of Solzhenitsyn, and I also know you know that Malcolm Muggeridge was a very first prominent Western journalist who wrote of the terror and the famine. Uh, he did it at the time when Walter Durante was lying to the New York Times and getting Pulitzer and Nobel Prizes for it. I would advise them to read Flann O'Brien. I would advise them to read Charles. I would advise them most of all in terms of to reading, read Francis Bacon's essays. They are the best lead story, the best lines leading a story. Here's one. What is truth, said jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. If you want to know how to write a lead sentence, read any of Bacon's essays. They have the most beautiful thing. Other thing to write, there's only one thing, Jordan, if I may use your first name, that anyone who seriously wants to write or wants to write stuff that is serious as opposed to some victim's diary, read. Read other people. Read other novels. There's nothing that will t help you more in the art of writing than reading. And you could also add one more thing. If you read, say, The Great Gatsby, if you read a paragraph, sit, sit back or read a poem and ask yourself, if I were to write this, if I had to communicate this thought, how would I have said it? And then compare it with what Scott Fitzgerald did. Anyway, uh, I think I've probably dragged you, sir, to the point of perhaps mortal tedium. <laughs> so I'm going to stop it right there. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you speaking with me. Mm -hmm.